to Arts and Sciences Telluride 2024. Program is uh, focused on the topic of the nature of information, uh, really uh, giving a primarily an ecological, a whole systems view of our information environment, which uh, many of us uh, know and think about information, but information is so much more than most of us consider, and it's all around us, and every living thing senses and communicates, and uh, our actions, our remarkable actions with technology, with our own human social progress, is having a great impact on the information environment in ways we rarely understand. And I think it's an important issue. I also think that one of the purposes of this program, these 12 lasers over eight days, is uh, that issues of climate change, issues of uh, water uh, and population and migration, all the major so-called grand challenges we face as societies, um, cannot be addressed unless we also think ecologically about our information and communications environment, which is not just out there, but in here. And uh, we are polluting that environment in some ways. We're also doing very remarkable things. This, uh, this medium right here allows us at no cost, really, although there are costs. There are energy costs. There are all sorts of... Uh, behind the uh, the back of the envelope costs um, to our free international global internetworking communications environment now. So uh, this program presents over 12 lasers, some remarkable individuals uh, around the world, not just in the US, but uh, talking to us from Tokyo, from uh, the Netherlands, uh, from Canada, many other places, and the US. Um, and these individuals, um, I invited these people, uh, Richard Lowenberg, I don't think I said that. Uh, I, I invited people, some who I knew, some who I didn't, and I'm very grateful to know. Um, these are people who are example setters. They're not just talking about things, but they're doing. And they're also inspiring communicators for the most part. And that was a sort of an invitational criteria in my mind. And so today we have uh, two really special individuals. Um, I'll start by uh, just uh, saying a few words about Daniel Collins, Dan Collins. We've known each other uh, since 1986 uh, and uh, Dan lives uh, part of the time and has a property, a family property, uh, just a few miles outside of Telluride, Colorado. And uh, uh, he's also a professor in the arts and uh, other areas that he'll talk about at Arizona State University. Uh, our other guest is Jim Enote. And uh, I like when one looks at Jim's bio online, one often sees uh, Zuni Farmer. Uh, and uh, he is also uh, more highly credentialed than that, uh, 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 but he does represent some remarkable regional uh, sort of Colorado Plateau and Four Corners region uh, and beyond um, interests and concerns and on the ground work uh, uh, with the Colorado Plateau Foundation, the Grand Canyon Trust, and uh, the Wilderness Society in uh, ways and many other, uh, Jim, Jim is a, we're just getting to know each other a little bit and he's a remarkable individual. So I'm actually gonna turn this over to uh, Jim Enote to do uh, the first of two presentations before we have a bit of a discussion. Jim. Thank you, Richard. Uh, what I would like to do first is show this short about nine minute video clip that is titled Countermapping. And just a little backstory on that. It's, uh, uh, I've always been interested in maps like, like so many of you here. Uh, and I, I've always been interested in the way that place can be represented in ways that are familiar to me using my kinds of sensibilities and so sensibilities of those that live around me. And when I say live around me, I mean, 
the Zuni village. So I'm, I'm from Zuni, New Mexico. I'm a Zuni tribal member. And there are certain sensibilities of place that people there uh, employ when talking about place. Uh, and so I think this, this short film will help represent that. I should say that this film was made uh, in one of my prior careers. It's about seven years old, I think, when I was the museum uh, director at Zuni. Uh, we'll, let's, let's show the film first and we can have some, I'll, I'll talk about it later. We live in a world with many ways of knowing, with many different systems of knowledge. Knowledge that Zuni people have about the landscape has been underestimated, hasn't been clearly understood. It's time to assert that we have the knowledge of place and challenge the idea of what maps are about. You're coming back. You got eaten up by rabbits, but you're making it. Oh, there's some ears even. I've been planting 60 consecutive years ever since I was in a cradle board. My grandmas and aunties put seeds in my hands, and then they put me over a hole. I planted it. The next year I planted, the next year, next year, next year. Everywhere I live, I always planted something. Most of it here. Zuni is a, a place where most people live within two minutes of every living relative and dead relative. I think knowing where you're from is important. What other people call you is what really makes you of this place. First, some of them know me as a farmer. Some of them don't even know I'm a museum director. My name is Jim Enote, and I'm the director of the Ashwe Awan Museum here in Zuni, New Mexico. There's my field right there. And I can see the corn is dead and dry. It's kind of creepy to look down on. It's disorienting. One time I showed my mother some aerial photos. Her first response was, uh, I'm not a bird. She says, that's not how I look at things. She, she asked me, what am I looking at? I don't know what I'm looking at. Maps have done a lot to confuse things for people. And I think more lands have been lost to native peoples, probably through mapping, than through physical conflict. I wanted to make some maps that were both elegant, evocative, and profoundly important to the Zuni people. And that's where the map art idea came from. These were at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Of course, it's going to be one of the last ones. I had no idea at the beginning that so much story would come out of this map making process. At first, I thought we would create some new kinds of maps that counter and challenge the notion of what maps are, where north does not have to be at the top, that scale is unnecessary. What's more important is these stories of the history described in these vignettes of experience. And now these are here for all Zunis to learn from, from here on these maps become a thing that helps a family or a group to start speaking about places, to start 
learning from each other and talking about places in a way that's uniquely Zuni. If we were to go outside our doors now and walk downstream from the Zuni River, it would take us right back into the Grand Canyon. It's like an umbilical cord connecting us back to the place that we came out from Mother Earth. When I come to this place, it's like a special place on the bookshelf of the library, our culture's library. Well, today we take pictures, sometimes selfies of ourselves, when our ancestors were marking on the rocks here, things that they saw, like turkeys and deer. And there's stuff all over. You can see things, zigzags and hash marks. It's a fish. That's a really rare one. Religious leaders began to see petroglyphs here that are the same as those in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. A certain clan symbol, a certain way of making a spiral. It has a Zuni signature. That helps us to connect these dots and bring the whole story together. We limit ourselves if we think of maps as only two-dimensional. The map may be something we heard from our grandmother about a place. There are maps in songs and in prayers. There are maps that are etched in stone and woven into textiles and painted on ceramics. Google Maps and any other kinds of maps really, well, they're very helpful. The names around here are in English or Spanish and so they completely leave off the meaning of the place. It is replacing our language and eclipsing our language and knowledge with something different, something that's not really from here. This whole constellation of what makes up a map to me is, has always been far beyond a piece of paper. Imagine ancestors traveling for days, looking for water, being parched, thirsty. Imagine coming to this valley and finding this. And they said, this is, this is where we'll stay. When you grow old with a community and all of their great, 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 great grandmothers are from this place. That carries a kind of identity and profoundness that you can't find anywhere else. When people have a map that is part of affirming their identity, it tells them that they are of this place. I, I feel part of something with this work. If my grandpa and grandma would see the Zuni maps, I think they would have recognized quickly, oh yeah, this is what's in that song. This is what's in those prayers. And I think as their descendants, they would have been proud. A lot of things that our grandparents tell us and pass down to us, they always say, remember these things remember it and too often things are forgotten but I think the map art is going to be something where they'll say you remembered
Well, thank you for the opportunity to share that short film. Uh, I think that featuring some of this work of counter mapping is fitting and, and timely as the world struggles with a, a lingering pandemic and political soul searching. Now more than ever, the question, what information do we trust and value is profoundly relevant. I think the expanding global society and in, an increasingly transcultural world and the ascendancy of the information age can give can give the impression that geographic borders are defunct. There are fluid economic geographies, digitally influence political inclinations, and the arts have activated new interests in intuitive and inquiring maps and portrayals. As a philosophical practice, countermapping exalts liberation and artistic freedom. And it speaks for the revision of traditional mapping to bring about an imaginative and refreshed society, an ethos of truth, really, and, and arrange places and events as spirited parts of a cosmological process. So I know, I think we all know maps have always been a form of subjectivity, informing this, not necessarily that. Oh, several several years ago, uh, as as we were talking, as I, as you saw in that film, I, I showed my mother a map, and I I made that map using some cartographic software. And her response was, "Yeah, what am I looking at?" Uh, and, and I told her it was a map of our village, and uh, the specific colors I chose depicted trails and and waterways. And I told her she needed to imagine, to imagine looking straight down on a landscape to make sense of the map. And as in the film, my, my mother said, but I'm not a bird. So that was quite naturally an, an epiphany. And I said, yes, mom, yeah, you are not a bird. Uh, and yes, she is a human with a distinctive way of looking at the world. So I think counter mapping opens the door for a new kind of agency and, and influence for for different ways of knowing. Uh, the ex, uh, this, this kind of work that we exhibited, these, these map art pieces, uh, I think it challenges the, the colonial histories of maps and opens, opens doors to new expressions of ordering place, uh, encounters multiple knowledge systems, and asserts that it is unnecessary to be a practice mapping technician to make information in make maps and information informative and influential. And I would say still too that in the simplest ways, my my stride is my ultimate measure. So I, as I'm planting seeds and I'm nurturing and cultivating, harvest and give thanks, I then reflect. And I continually remind myself that we live in a world with damaged peoples and people left behind. We also live in a world with environmental limits. We cannot continue to take from the planet without giving back. And we must not continue to neglect vulnerable people. So now is the time to make counter maps and share different ways of knowing more widely and with compassion and accessibility. So I'll just stop there. And I know Dan has some wonderful things to say about maps and his work as well. And I look forward to a little conversation afterwards. Thank you so much, Jim. That was a great beginning to uh, today's uh, arts and sciences program on the nature of information. It, it, uh, what you were talking about resonates deeply and reminded me of a very well-known quote that comes out of, uh, um, I think it's by a, 
a, a man named Cor Corbisky. I may be wrong there. Uh, the world of uh, semantics. And that quote we all know is, the map is not the territory. Uh, and I think uh, with that, I'll introduce Dan Collins, who's gonna talk about community and bioregional and uh, related approaches to mapping again in this region uh, for now. Dan Collins. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Jim. That was a wonderful intro to the topic today. Um, I'm going to jump into a series of slides uh, and uh, try to kind of, this is really very complimentary in, in our uh, preparatory discussions uh, before uh, actually even meeting Jim face to face. We were uh, made aware of one another's work and uh, I was really taken with the concept of counter mapping and it definitely echoes and resonates with my interest in something I've come to call community mapping, which is a commonly used term, and I'll define it shortly. But the idea, I want to say a little bit about uh, counter mapping and the term counter as a, as a kind of a modifier of resistance. Uh, there was a piece in the New York Times just uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, librarians in the 1920s Harlem who were practicing what was called, or what has come to be called, counter-cataloging. And these uh, Black librarians were frustrated by the fact that they were limited by the uh, kind of given categories from the Library of Congress and the uh, organizational strategies of the Dewey Decimal System. And they began to, of course, everything was on three by five cards, index cards that were in these long drawers, for those of you that remember libraries of, of the past. Um, and so they were actually um, doing this surreptitious act of writing new three by five cards to represent uh, categories of the Black experience that were, weren't adequately represented in uh, the current system in the 20s. And so... Uh, Black culture in general was limited to, I think, just a couple of topics. One was slavery and one was insurrection. And so the idea of, of reducing this highly reductive kind of process of reducing an entire people and culture to uh, these predetermined categories echoes very strongly with what um, I've been learning about maps over the years, how they are generally top down and uh, are created by those in control, those with power, uh, generally the dominant culture. So I'm gonna jump in here to my slides and uh, let me see, I've got, I have a little arrow, there we go. So this is probably, this may be a map that we all grew up with, uh, you know, that you pull down in the front of the elementary school classroom. And of course it shows, uh, good old USA right in the center of the map, which is sort of ludicrous in this case because we see Asia split, you know. But this idea of, of creating maps that, uh, uh, you know, privilege your own point of view is, is commonplace. I mean, and there's, there's just myriad examples of this, that cultures tend to produce maps that come out of their own experience and assert their own uh, dominance and their own points of view. So zooming into uh, our own uh, territory here, here, this is a topographic map of our immediate vicinity of Telluride. Here's Telluride right here in 1898 using uh, <clears throat> topo topo topographic strategies to show uh, altitude differences and so on. I think everybody's familiar with topographic maps. Uh, some that you may not have seen are these more um, detailed maps which begin to um, call out uh, the reason that so many people migrated to Telluride because of the, the mineral, the rich mineralization of the region. And so the names that begin to be um, inserted into this landscape are names that sort of echo uh, the, uh, the dominant culture of the day of the, of the mid to late 19th century. Here you see Telluride uh, around 1898 and 
uh, the primary names that you're seeing right here are the names of the mines up uh, in the mountains, just pretty much right at Treeline, north of Telluride. Of course, mines completely surrounded the town of Telluride and mineral was brought down via uh, tunnels and via gondolas down into the mill area, which is depicted right here. So the map is reflecting the dominance of uh, the uh, mining industry um, in the late 19th century. <clears throat> and, you know, I was struck by what Jim was saying that the names uh, in the dominant cultural, uh, the dominant cultural sort of uh, entity um, su supplant or, or there's even a sense of erasure where the, the original, for example, Zuni names are not, do not generally appear on the maps that we use when we navigate across uh, the Four Corners region. And so we lose that sense of place because those names, especially in indigenous culture, are highly descriptive of particular kinds of qualities of place. Here's just a couple more. Uh, they're, they're quite wonderful as graphics, but you can see that, again, uh, in this uh, kind of oblique uh, view of the San Miguel River down at, at Placerville and where Leopard Creek dumps into the San Miguel River. This is coming down from Dallas Divide and dumping into the San Miguel, which goes down to the Dolores and ultimately down to the Colorado River. Uh, but this is detailing uh, some of the placer mines uh, up and down the San Miguel River where they were actually mining gold in the gravel beds as opposed to the hard rock mining that was occurring up above Telluride. Now, as an alternative, uh, where maybe it's not about the dominant uh, culture or the, the hegemony of uh, local culture that is um, finding or manifesting maps that sort of express their dominance, but the idea of a community map in my mind is something that sort of inverts that paradigm, that it begins to provide um, a, uh, a sense of agency. That's a term that Jim used, and I often re return to that term, a sense of agency to local people. So in this particular map, um, there was a black community in Detroit, and this was made by um, a, a group called the Detroit Geographical Expedition and Institute in the late 1960s. Well, there was a situation in this uh, fairly densely packed uh, urban situation in Detroit where uh, black children were getting run over by commuters that would speed through these neighborhoods. And uh, the neighborhood folks were not getting any, uh, they, they weren't being listened to. They weren't, they, their voices were not being heard. So the Detroit Geographical Expedition took it upon themselves to begin mapping the places in these intersections where black children are being uh, either, either injured or even killed. And so armed with this uh, bottom-up uh, mapping of this, you know, of this truth of the condition, uh, they were able to, the black community was able to get changes made in terms of provisions for pedestrians and barriers and so on that protected the children in the neighborhood. So this is a this is a very early instance of what I'd call community mapping. And I definitely call this a counter map. Um, so community mapping, or I would say counter maps uh, are characterized by their incorporation of local knowledge, their integration and contextualization of spatial and cultural information, honest, you know, real information. And third, uh, a form that allows participants to dynamically interact with input and analyze alternatives for themselves. They're able to generate uh, a representation that is more true to their experience. Now in this region, uh, we're back, back to Telluride now, but this, this shows a so-called GIS map, a, ge a geographic information system that is depicting the entire county. So the San this is San Miguel County. It's uh, about 100 miles long, 20 miles wide. You can see that the boundaries of, of this county reflect the Jeffersonian grid that goes all the way back to around 1800, uh, where there is the idea of 
dividing up space uh, just almost arbitrarily uh, using a, uh, a reticule uh, that is on a one, a one mile uh, kind of grid. So here you see the Utah Colorado border and where the land is flat, uh, where it comes up, you know, around Norwood and so on, those people who know this local landscape, it's relatively flat with gullies and so on, and there's no problem creating a, a straight line. But when you get up into the mountains, the boundary is following the ridge lines. And I've always thought this is a very interesting kind of profile that sort of indicates two ways of, of knowing, if you will, you know, this ridge line is something that's given to us by the contours of the watershed, whereas this is uh, a kind of abstract notion that is just reflective of a one mile grid. Uh, now, the other thing that was really interesting a number of years ago, this goes back to the early 2000s, um, around 2006, 2007, the San Miguel uh, County Planning Office began uh, a process of putting all of uh, county uh, maps and tax records and infrastructure and everything on a local GIS, which was really uh, you know, very progressive at the time. And so uh, Heather Windland, who was the, uh, one, the county planner at the time, was the GIS specialist who was charged with putting all of these layers onto this, onto this map. Well, um, let me go forward a little bit, complete the story. So here's, here's uh, just zooming into Telluride, and we're seeing that um, uh, a, a typical GIS combines a spatial logic, a kind of graphic, graphic information that defines this place, but it also provides a, a, um, a database that boils everything down to a spreadsheet, essentially. So it, it's quite powerful as a software tool because you, you have this um, combination, this, this uh, two methods of representation that are supporting one another through this spreadsheet information, which is in the case of ESRI products is, is recorded in something called ARC, ARC catalog. And the map itself, the visual the visual information is is created in something it called arc map and so these things correspond to one another and if we look more closely this would be the the kinds of uh information that the county felt were at the time felt was important to include in this gis so we have property information and you know sites of interest transportation corridors um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But these are all fairly pragmatic, practical kinds of issues. So I made a proposal to the county commissioners uh, around 2007 that we uh, add a cultural layer to this. I called it a cultural layer. I didn't call it an art layer, but in any case, um, uh, they were very uh, open to this idea. I actually made a formal presentation at a county commissioner's meeting and they approved the idea. And so we set about creating uh, cultural destinations that would ultimately be included in the county GIS. Now this came simultaneously with the sort of rise of, of Google Maps and everybody had now a map on, in their phone. And so the, the, uh, the drive to actually produce this specialized GIS kind of the wind was taken out of its sails because everybody had all of those destinations at their fingertips in a phone. But it's an interesting kind of way of thinking about landscape. How do you uh, not reduce the landscape to uh, a pragmatic set of uh, kind of uh, practical sites and infrastructure and so on that have nothing to do with how people actually inhabit a place? or what the feelings are of place, or what the meanings are of place. Now, there's been some attempts to uh, use G using GIS as a platform to, to kind of run counter to that with something called participatory GIS, some kind, sometimes called PGIS. I mean, you know, we go crazy with our acronyms. But in this case, this was a project done out of um, England where there were some uh, researchers at Leeds University that, that wanted the, to empower the community to input different kinds of information into the GIS. And they were thinking, well, people aren't going to, the 
you know, typing in geocoordinates and so on. They're they're wanting some kind of much more fluid way of uh, inputting information into the map. And so they came up with, I thought, something quite clever where they would use uh, a virtual spray can and spray in areas of concern in their neighborhood or in the in the metropolitan area. And that spray can uh, done again and again and again by multiple users, inhabitants of that particular metropolitan area would create in essence a density map showing where there were concerns about crime and safety. Uh, so that information could then be shared. So you're getting bottom up information that's being facilitated by the powers that be. So it's kind of a hybrid combination, partly top down, partly bottom up. And one has to, of course, trust that the powers that be are working in your best interest. Okay, so just a quick kind of clarification, a GIS, a geographic information system is by definition exclusionary. It favors quantifiable description and systematic knowledge. It is a top down process. The intention of a participatory GIS, Geographic Information System, is inclusive. It seeks out subjective qualities that may be missed by conventional mapping. It is a bottom-up process. Now, this, this idea of a, of a bottom-up PGIS has really gone international, and there's been some wonderful examples over the years, um, in the past couple of decades, in this case, this is showing just a process I'll walk you through here that is mapping the specific kinds of um, qualities of place that local inhabitants are aware of and value. So in this case, there's a, a large background map, just a simple outline of the local environment. And then uh, with a combination of clay and paint, local residents are actually using their physical processes of actually modeling their own landscape and highlighting different things that wouldn't normally be uh, viewed or represented on a you know classic dominant culture map. So we're seeing houses for the elderly, for example, or uh, vehicles for evacuation, uh, boats. These are things that the local the local people felt were important. That map, once it was finished, was re-photographed, and then the result is this map on the right. So we're seeing this is the map that was produced using traditional satellite uh, imaging processes, you know, which is, you know, they're pretty cool, but they don't talk about qualities of place, right? Whereas this is the people's view, which is uh, the pooled knowledge that supplements the conventional spatial information. So again, a kind of hybrid process that uh, tries to act as a kind of corrective to the top-down uh, processes that are characteristic of mapping. Now, another kind of region internationally that's been using uh, you know, pretty high-end tools and satellite mapping and cell phones and so on is in uh, Africa. And this is actually showing uh, the location of cell phones. And in this region, indigenous farmers are pooling their resources together and purchasing one cell phone and, uh, and then working in a manner that allows them to trade information with other regional partners. And they can pool information and bypass the middlemen in terms of, for example, the price of crops or weather patterns or other things. And so their sense of being able to uh, have agency in their landscape and expanding their pool of knowledge at the, at the kind of micro level to include a kind of a regional understanding is facilitated by this use of cell phone technology. This goes back a few years, and this was actually put together by a couple of artists I'll mention in a second. So this is um, uh, when they are tagging this, uh, the geocoordinates will be brought into um, the phone environment. You can see this goes back a ways, 2011, but this is showing uh, 
the status of corn crops in April of 2011 and showing its growth between uh, you know those those months. Uh, this is two subsequent years, just as a way of giving a sense of of the time frame. Um, yeah, I actually have more slides on this, and I I took them out. But anyway, the idea of um, uh, this whole project is called the Voice of the Farmers, uh, and this is the actual website sautiawakulima.net, which is, literally translates to the voice of the farmers. So, you know, again, collective action through the technology and uh, helping them to uh, bypass uh, a, a very complex apparatus where the middlemen are, are often benefiting at the expense of the local farmer. This is a... A, a project that I, I know that Richard and Jim are both aware of called Seed Broadcast. And this is actually centered in New Mexico, in Albuquerque. And uh, Chrissy Orr and, uh, is one of the principals who um, kind of developed this project. But the idea is to create a community based on heirloom seeds. And they have this really cool van kind of panel truck that has, it's like a rolling library of seeds, of heirloom seeds. And this shows uh, their pathway of one of many pathways that they've taken where they go to uh, local communities and they gather seeds and archive them and share them uh, uh, as, as people desire. And this of course runs counter to uh, the kind of top-down uh, monocultures that are being promoted by companies like Monsanto. So here, here for example, is a display where um, the resources from the van are brought into a public display where people are actually uh, both providing and giving, but also receiving information and seeds uh, from these different regions. And here you see a more detailed map uh, that shows the specific kinds of species of seeds and so on that are um, being shared. This is a little project I did back in 2011 with uh, David La Lavender's English class. <laughs> and this was a, also a, an interesting moment because it, again, it was at the time that uh, we had a, we had a bag full of, uh, GPS sensors and, you know, Garmin, Trimble type handheld uh, GPS sensors where we could get lat long and record limited information. But these were, this was a project done with ninth graders. And it was hilarious because half of them had smartphones and they were already tuned into the idea of uh, geo coordinates and tagging uh, geolocations with uh, information. So this one young man named Brian Ian, um, when I said, well, the challenge today is to map all of the prairie dog holes on the valley floor, but he, he was out there like a shot and he walked a rasterized pattern and put a pin wherever there was a prairie dog hole. For those of you who live locally, I know, I mean, prairie dogs, this is like, you either love prairie dogs or you hate prairie dogs. You know, there's no middle ground. But anyway, it was inf interesting because there was a real lack of information. And so we were able to share the density of this, this prairie dog town on the valley floor with uh, the valley, the folks that are managing the valley floor. They were very appreciative. And there have been uh, various strategies. We don't need to talk too much about prairie dogs, but there's been various strategies that were informed by the density of prairie dog holes in certain parts of the valley. How can you kind of move them out of certain conditions, sensitive conditions, and so on? But this is definitely a bottom-up. I mean, it's using Google, Google Maps for sure, but it's it's harnessing that at the, uh, in a way that's at the service of the community. And then I think everybody in this community is is a excited about various softwares that allow for uh, recording uh, observations of 
things like fungi, for example, and all different kinds of species. There's a wonderful site called iNaturalist. Uh, here's the website. Uh, and this shows just one little snippet of information where uh, it shows observations of fungi in the local region. Okay. In this case, it's closer to Silverton, just over the mountain. So uh, you're getting uh, time information, you're getting geocoordinates, you're getting uh, visuals in the, in the form of one or more photography. In some cases, it will actually give uh, detailed scientific information. Uh, 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 taxonomy, uh, taxonometric information, and so on. So then there's a lot of sites like this, but iNaturalist is, is a good one. Now, something that I've been playing with is, again, this idea of trying to combine these, these different ways of knowing or different systems of, um, you know, organizing information and uh, special, and it, particularly when it comes to spatialized data. In this case, this is... Um, a uh, an outline of the, the local watershed. So here again is Telluride, and we're seeing the San Miguel River flow down to the Dolores River, which flows down to the Colorado. And excuse me, Dolores River goes up here and then flows down the Colorado this way. Um, and so I did a project that um, I essentially called Poetry with Geocoordinates, the idea that uh, what are the artists doing at specific locations across this beautiful landscape? And uh, a lot of a lot of you know Art Good Times, who's uh, one of our favorite locals, who was long-term county commissioner and uh, local fungophile, ran the Mushroom Festival, is very involved in the organization of the Mushroom Festival, and a major poet. And he runs something uh, called. Talking Gourds, which is one of the programs of our uh, Telluride Institute. And so this is just an example of the poetry that he wrote that directly relates to the landscape he lives in, looking south to the Lone Cone, uh, which is just outside of Norwood, Colorado. Um, and I won't read the whole poem, maybe just the first stanza, love it or leave it, the rednecks say, and I'm all roots, and getting redder here at Cloud Acre, looking south to Lone Cone. So I did a I did a project uh, with a, 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 a long list of local artists. Some were watercolorists, poets, um, uh, video artists, uh, performance artists, etc. And they all they all had to come up with a way of. Um, defining their place, framing their place, and then adding the kind of site-specific artwork that would uh, resonate with this place. And then, then that subsequently was placed on a map, on this map. So all of these pins, this is an early, uh, an early uh, version of it, is showing pins where there were artworks made in relationship to this place defined by the local watershed. Okay, I'm, I know I'm running out of time here. So uh, now this is a, a current project and I'm working on a water quality app called Scape. And this is something that is freely downloadable and uh, I will provide the URL upon request, but uh, this gives a way of, for students in particular, to record information about going on field trips, looking at the local um, water bodies. And so they're looking at chemical information, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, conductivity, et cetera. And they're also looking at the biotic uh, information, uh, macroinvertebrates, such as in this case, the Dobson fly, which is the larva for um, a, a fly that would be uh, indicative of water quality. And I've recently partnered up with something called Green Map in Brooklyn. And the uh, use of the app, the Scape app, or just at the, the front edge of uh, using the Scape app to actually populate uh, 
green maps, a project that Wendy Brower in Brooklyn has been uh, shepherding for some 30 years. And so this, this is an international kind of view of all the different green map projects that are going on, all dealing with the power of maps to connect people to positive action on, on climate change. It's an international perspective, but then uh, representing and empowering locals uh, in your, your local neighborhood. And this is just one more indication of showing how the SCAPE water quality app is going to be integrated into the green map. And that's all I have. So if you're interested in any of these topics or want more information about the SCAPE app, please reach out to me at dan at telluriteinstitute.org. I'm the, I'm the president of the, of the Telluride Institute and love to talk to you. Oh. Great. Hi, Ken. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. I think that was all. Yeah, I'm audible. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. Um, I'm looking forward to a bit of discussion in a moment. Um, I wasn't going to mention, I, I've also had uh, involvements with uh, various approaches to mapping and understanding place. Um, and I'll just mention one project briefly, although Nan knows a bit about some others that involve watershed mapping and so on. But uh, living in Telluride, living now in Santa Fe, um, part of uh, it, it's because I have a, a deep personal, just inherent love of the Colorado Plateau region. This four corners, geophysical and spiritual and uh, informational region. And so I haven't done much with it, but for over 20 years, I've been compiling a personal creative project that uh, looks at uh, understanding the information ecosystems of the Colorado Plateau, not the material or the physical aspects of the region, but informational and communication uh, uh, in that region. Uh, as an example for any region possibly to look at. Um, and that includes things like, uh, well, time is a great uh, uh, aspect of information. You know, places change over time. Uh, our perceptions change over time. So there's really fascinating historical maps, pre-Spanish uh, and European uh, moves into this region, but including the early European and Spanish uh, mapping of these places uh, Jim was talking about, that Dan is talking about, and there's uh, it, it's just fascinating to see over time maps being created. But I've also, I mean, for me, it's been a, a work that allows me to just keep going back to different parts of the Colorado Plateau. It's just a way to connect with that region, uh, which is so rich. Um, and uh, so the informational mapping includes uh, song cycles and storytelling and animal sounds. And uh, on the other end of the spectrum are telecommunications infrastructure in the region. Where is there wireless coverage? Where isn't there? Where are quiet areas? Where is noise? Uh, uh, the information environment is really rich and it's just a fascinating project just a personal ongoing creative work uh, that takes me to the color visit parts of the plateau and continue to look and online and other pla other places to dig up resources and talk to people and you know uh, storytelling by individuals in the region is a major part of the information environment of the region uh, and uh, there's been a lot of works with uh, um, recordings of uh, oral storytelling and histories and so on. But uh, that, that's that been a mapping project of sorts uh, for me uh, that's just uh, involved me with the place. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, and the non-physical. I, I, I think we're going to talk in other, I'll talk a little after us in a minute. We have plenty of time yet. Um, but um, we, we have programs during this next week on, for instance, the uh, information economy. Uh, you know, how do you value information, uh, whatever that 
information is. It's a word like the word art. It means so many things with just a few letters uh, in, in, a, in a particular vocabulary. Uh, and in fact, information, like many other words in the English language, information is a noun. It's a thing. When in fact, I think information is a verb. Uh, just like we are not him, her, they, we are verbs. We are constantly evolving, constantly changing. We are never the same. Uh, and uh, our language, just like our maps, sort of sort of physicalize. Uh, and it's part of living in a uh, uh, the kind of society, the dominant society we're in, which is very much a material culture. And, and propagates materialistic thinking when really everything is dynamic. Um, and how do you then express that or attempt to understand that? And how do you even talk about that? How do you communicate things that are not static? You know, even rocks are not mm -hmm. static. Uh, they evolve slowly given our time frame. Um, and so there's so many ways to approach this kind of information. And I think it's a really important area to extend in so many ways. Information is everywhere. It's fundamental to real to our reality uh, is informational. And it's also, uh, I often quote, as many people do, uh, Gregory Bateson uh, uh, on um, his, his advocacy of eco-mindedness. Steps to an Ecology of Mind was one of his great book titles. Um, and I, I think that's one of the real central requirements of our societies today, is, and especially of our um, lifelong learning uh, initiatives, whether they're formal schools and teaching and learning or uh, on one's own path. Uh, you know, how we learn and what we learn it's like economics. It doesn't matter what your currency is. What matters is what and how you value uh, what things and how, you know, as a basis then for exchange. Uh, yeah, we're, we're often valuing those resources that we're mapping mostly as physical uh, things that can, you know, just like wheat or minerals or so on. Uh, years ago, I went to a Department of Commerce meeting at the very beginning of the internet era, the, the first year of the Clinton-Gore administration, because I was very involved with the internet early days. And um, the Department of Commerce and government officials and academics at this two-day meeting on what is the new digital economy, they said, oh, at the end of two days of back and forth negotiation, this is easy. Information is property uh, yeah. to be bought, sold, regulated, rented. You know, we are all renters of this in the information, in this online information environment. We pay a monthly subscription to a corporation, usually, that uh, the government has given rights to long term management and even ownership of our information infrastructure. Very few places uh, have actually local community-based uh, stewardship like we do of water or soil or other things, the plants. St local stewardship of our own and economic stewardship of our information infrastructure. We're pretty much sending our local monies to be connected out to some corporate entities. I think that's part of a system that many of us have deep concerns about uh, because it's not sustainable, as we know. It is counter to sustainability. Dan, I think that I'll open it up. I'll stop. No, well, well, thank you. No, thank you for putting it, giving us that broader context, Richard. It's so important to understand that. I, I had a question for Jim, or I, maybe I just wanted to selfishly hear him talk a little bit more, but I was struck by what uh, he was saying about his mother being literally disoriented uh, by the aerial photographs of Zuni and his fields and so on, uh, and she saying, I am not a bird. Uh, but this idea of um, disorientation and how can uh, how can a different kind of map that is providing agency for locals, 
uh, reorient us to place. I think you've discussed this, but I'd love to hear you talk about this a little bit more. What are some of the strategies of mapping that you've shared with some of your 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 family? Yeah. Well, first, uh, Richard, let me just say, as you were talking about um, your interest in the Colorado Plateau region and uh, uh, doing your studies about everything from access to uh, uh, cellular coverage or uh, languages, all, all these sort of things. I think the Colorado Plateau is well positioned for that kind of study. I mean, it's a place where people have been, like myself, my ancestor has been here at least 600 generations, and there's still remaining bits of information etched in stone, uh, you know, petroglyphs, and there's uh, long living languages as well in this region. I, in where I live, we speak Zuni, which happens to be a language isolate. But as you know, too, there's Athabascan language, Karizian languages, Tewa, Tewa languages, uh, Utoas, Taken languages, many, many different languages in this region. And we speak English, too, and maybe some other languages. Well, my grandmother spoke uh, Tewa, Hopi, Zuni, English and a little bit of French, but but except for the French, she was fluent in all those disparate languages. Wow. Um, so the, the plateau is very well positioned for this kind of uh, inquiry. Um, and so, uh, Dan, uh, th these kinds of maps that that I was uh, really helping others to to create it was based on the idea of really local sensibilities uh, and by that i mean sensibilities of of colors for one uh, often on maps we look at a topographic map it's going to be there's going to be blacks and maybe some oranges and greens maybe green represents forests uh, browns maybe represent Bureau of Land Management lands, things like that, right? Um, but they're very limited, and uh, not to disparage anything with, with uh, geographic information systems, but yeah, they have a limited palette mm -hmm. as well. You know, a limited palette of colors and line thicknesses and so on, polygon shapes and such. Yeah, uh, again, not disparaging. I think if, if I was, if I ever had to go to court, I hope I never do, but if I had to prove something that had to do with uh, landscapes, I would use a uh, GIS computer generated maps just because it's become such a standard. But I would also introduce as evidence my own handmade maps or maps made by others. But going back to these sensibilities that uh, it, it is colors. Uh, it is also as in, as mentioned in that film, there could be vignettes of information about places. Mm -hmm. So those with those uh, that map are when they were being made, I should say too that uh, I, I gathered people together that had standing in our village, in our community, educators, religious leaders, po powerful theocratic leaders, uh, and others, and just introduced this idea of, of making new kinds of maps, really that were accessible. So that key word there is accessibility. They're accessible that uh, you don't have to be a technician to make these maps or to understand them because all of us here probably have had some training at, at some point in how to read a topographic map or we've had some training in how to use the right keystrokes to, to create maps. Uh, but in, in that process, then we become gatekeepers of, of uh, geographic knowledge. But we wanted to do this in a way that made uh, ideas and knowledge of place accessible. Uh, but uh, I should say that on this topic of uh, information as property, right? See, I, we also have to remember that, for example, where, where I grew up, when, when I was little, uh, the, the adults at the dinner table, after we finished dinner and pushed the plates aside, They'd say to us uh, youngsters, 
you have to leave the room. We're going to talk about something you're not supposed to know about. And we just all said, okay. And we, we left the table. And um, our friends or others in, in our village, they, they went through the same thing all the time. And some evenings, again, a different circumstance, a different time, adults would say to us, there's a, there's a, a, a cabinet or a place in that back room with a, a curtain hanging. Don't, don't go beyond that curtain. Don't look in there. There's something there you're not supposed to see or touch. And we say, okay, okay. All our friends, all our schoolmates all heard the same kind of thing. And sometimes our, uh, the adults would tell us, we know uh, after school or during the summer, you guys go off to the dump and look for rubber for make slingshots or whatever you do out there at the dump. And you say, but there's some hills off there too, to the south. There's some hills with some rocks piled there. You should never go up there and don't bother what's there. And we'd say, okay, okay. All our friends do this too. So the, the idea there is that knowledge sometimes is held in silos or they're, or they're protected sometimes, right? Unless you're given the privilege or initiated into a particular group where you can access that, that knowledge. So when I went off to university, eventually, finally, after two years of hitchhiking after high school, but when I went to college and I sat in a lecture room and the professor said, knowledge should be free flowing and shared amongst everyone. Now we can write and publish and speak and talk about knowledge and share it. It just, it's, it's all over. We should, it should be accessible. And I thought, interesting. That's not the way it was like when, where I grew up. <laughs> so, so it's just, it's, uh, it just points out that again, we live in a world with multiple ways of knowing and different ontologies and how we access information and knowledge is different in different in places. So that's that's important in this. So in the making these maps, it was about when I gathered those people together, I said, let's let's talk about making new kinds of maps that are accessible. We actually met uh, maybe twice a month during lunch for one year before we even made the first map because we spent that first year just talking about what we should not map mm -hmm. because of the power of making maps and, and what in in our, our system and where I live of how we share and exchange knowledge or not uh, is, is very profound and important. So we had to, we had to respect that. And so we spent a year just negotiating um, what kinds of things we would map, uh, what would be helpful for future generations, uh, and so on. And uh, it, it, when the time came, we felt very confident in, in saying, we're gonna make these new kinds of maps that for the benefit of the peoples, and they're actually for the Zuni people first. When we, act, when we put them in exhibition, for example, the uh, uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and as as viewers were going through the gallery and looking at them, some said, I, "I just don't, I don't get it. They're really interesting. They're beautiful. I can appreciate the brushstrokes, the technical aspects of it. They're really beautiful to look at, but I don't understand what's going on." And I happened to be there uh, with, with some uh, with some of the docents and others, and I said, "Well, these were made for a particular group of people, and and they understand them." So in your case, you may not understand it and you may not have access to understanding these maps, but sometimes we have to surrender to not knowing everything, right? So but it was interesting that those uh, viewers were both frustrated and at the same time respectful, but it was, it was for them a moment to encounter different ways of knowing. Right? Not many people have those kinds of encounters. Yeah. You know, in terms of what you're saying about what should not be mapped, that's such an interesting thing. I mean, just anecdotally around here, you know, you're not supposed to map where the chanterelles are, you know, just before the mushroom festival, <laughs> because that's that's gold. That's mountain gold that you don't want to share that secret. Uh, but thinking more about uh, your community in Zuni and the idea of what should not be shared, 
there was a question in the chat from our friend Ken Ronaldo, who says, who asks, are there attempts at maps that try to look at the perspectives of the animals? And I'm wondering if it, what your reaction to that is, that, is that something that should or should not be shared? And because the animals themselves are using very different ways of communication. And of course, we can talk about whales that have sensors that go around the, the entire globe and we track their movements. We understand something about behavior and they're, they're a very social animal and how they communicate, et cetera. But in terms of Zuni culture, is it appropriate to look at the perspectives of animals or are there ways of doing that if it is appropriate? Yeah, I, I, I did look at the chat. I, I tend not to look at the chats. I get distracted when I look at them. Yeah. yeah, well, that one distracted me. <laughs> oh, I apologize. But, but no, I actually, I, I, I don't even, I never look at the chats. But um, I, maybe it's just something I need to learn as we start doing this Zoom thing. But I like people raise their hand and just ask a question. But um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. And, and I think uh, when you think about how the universe is made up of you know, perfect and sublime creatures and what rights do we have and uh, sometimes at attaching a, a radio collar or or even a video camera uh, on some things years ago uh, as a, a young man working for the colorado division of wildlife actually i used to burn a uh, uh, band uh, prairie falcons for the Division of Wildlife. Oh. And uh, it was one of the coolest jobs I ever had. But uh, uh, when I think back on it, you know, I think it was important that they had bands on, on, on those falcons. And this was the late 70s, at a time when DDT was decimating uh, a lot of uh, raptors and my other migratory birds uh, in, in places like Central America, especially. And parts of North America, but uh, it was important for that kind of tracking, right? And understanding the mortality of, of these kind of uh, birds. But I think back, I think now it's like I, 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 I don't think I would want to ban any birds anymore. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't want something placed on me like a, a what do they call those when you're not incarcerated but you're released and you have a. a Oh, an ankle, ankle, ankle bracelet, yeah. Ankle monitor of some kind, yeah. I mean, you don't want that on you, but I guess it might be imposed on you. And I know my friend Eduardo Katz uh, did a project years ago where he actually had a tracker inserted into his leg uh, and uh, so that he was, you know, typically used for dogs. So that if your dog goes missing, you can track where it went. But he became a both pet and owner simultaneously. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to each, to each their own. <laughs> but you know, I um, years ago too, when I was a, a director of a natural resource department at the Zuni tribe, we had uh, foresters and wildlife people and the rest. And uh, the we had this conversation about uh, radio collaring deer, and so we we set up a uh, a uh, uh, committee of, of religious leaders and we asked them what do you think about radio collaring deer what and we asked them other questions for example like what are priority species do you mm -hmm. and one of the well they said we don't want we don't want to collar or tag any any of these uh of these creatures uh, that they are some of them are uh, they could be us in the future they might be some of our ancestors reincarnated uh, but they had plenty of reasons for that. But they also uh, said that the, their priority species were different from what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, yeah. uh, endangered species list might say. It's like they had so they would say like what we need is more work to protect red shafted flickers and turkey and and mule deer, and so that those were their priority species. But back to the subject about you know about. Uh, I think the like uh, animals and whether it's like we we map from them. I, mean, I, I think it's just fascinating. I mean, the more I learn about whales, and when I learn more about monarch butterflies, uh, 
it's 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 incredible. I mean, the the beauty and the, uh, just just the things that other creatures can do besides us. Uh, I, I take uh, actually, I feel some solace in knowing that there are other creatures that have these blessings and and uh, I, I don't know if we want to call it intelligence, but certainly this unique ability to navigate through the seas and through the skies in ways that we may not understand. I just surrender to it. I, and I just find solace in that. And I just, I just appreciate that. I don't need to know how they do it. I just, I just feel good in knowing that it happens. Um, I'd like, I'd like to uh, read one of the uh, comments and questions put into the chat mode. Uh, by Stephen Guerin. Stephen's based in Santa Fe. He's a scientist uh, and uh, very involved in uh, a certain approach to mapping um, that uh, involves the opposite of surveillance, uh, but surveillance, bottom up, uh, uh, watching rather than top down watching. Uh, but Stephen asks a question here the Northern New Mexico College. Uh, Northern Stewards Program, uh, I guess Northern New Mexico College, uh, where, I'm not sure where that is. Is that in Española maybe? Um, uh, they, they have a Northern Stewards Program that starts with Jim's counter mapping video. Uh, oh. <laughs> and, uh, and with uh, uh, papers and videos uh, uh, on the work of Eleanor Ostrom, the issue of the commons, uh, what is not private property or just non nonprofit, but uh, common stewarded uh, resources, common pool resources, so to speak. Uh, information, maybe, you know, as some people are advocating for water or for any, any other aspect of our uh, environment. Uh, uh, so Stephen says, my question relates to where maps are stored and self-sovereign management of internet domains for self-governance of access, uh, e.g. authentication and authorization, instead of posting it to corporate servers, where and how are you managing the mapping data? Okay. That goes to both of you, Jim and uh, Dan. Yeah, are we storing our things on Google or on right. uh, corporate domains or do we have uh, our own uh, means of with contemporary tools and so on, uh, maintaining our own data and providing access or not providing access? Uh, and I think just to uh, add to that, I was really taken with some of the words that Jim was using earlier uh, around the restriction of information. Um, uh, and, and the words were respect and, uh, and understanding and you know shared knowledge uh, i think there uh, even even how we approach not sharing information is an informational process that is very human and is not uh um something that is material you know in terms of making it property that can't well, be accessed yeah, absolutely absolutely shared, shared i mean yeah. I, th I think, you know, I mean, Jim, you were talking about, uh, you know, this difference in uh, traditional Zuni culture versus your university experience of knowledge should be shared. But of course, in a, in a, in a world where knowledge uh, is often exploited uh, for, in a, it's a, particularly in a capitalist system, it's very problematic. And also uh, privacy issues, identity issues, and so on are violated. I have to say, in terms of my work, it, it's gone I've run the gamut. You know, if you're in an academic environment, I think as many of us are, uh, you're held to some very high standards in terms of the protecting of, of personal data. And we go through an IRB, an institutional review board, and uh, and I had I have I had an exhaustive process in terms of the research that I some of the research I showed you relative to the Colorado River where that data had to be anonymized and protected and then destroyed after a particular interval. 
Um, now, on the other hand, that runs counter to the idea, well, gosh, we want to share this information. And so uh, I've got 20 high schools up and down the Colorado, across the Colorado River uh, watershed and that I work with. And the whole idea is that they're sharing information. Of course, it can be anonymized, so you're, you can protect the identity of the individual in that case. But say they're using that SCAPE uh, sensor, uh, sensing system and the app, they're uploading data to a shared database that they all have access through, uh, you know, a Google, a shared Google Drive. And, and I think that's very powerful. And one of the reasons, I mean, you know, whatever you think about Google, one of the reasons I settled upon it is that all of the teachers and all of the schools that were in that geographic region had access to that software and they could uh, participate uh, for almost no cost. And so it, you know, there's very compelling arguments on both sides here. Uh, so in terms of Jim's or Stephen's question about the uh, self-sovereign management of internet domains for self-governance, et cetera, I mean, uh, on one, one hand, I'm all for the protection of identity and because we don't want some kind of minority report future, right? The Tom Cruise movie where he's walking up and down the street and he's being bombarded with advertisements that key into his identity and are tied to geographic location. You know, well, that's crazy. That's a, that's a horrific future. Uh, so anyway, where and how are you managing the mapping data? I think that's a very compelling question and one to be resolved and different circumstances and different research projects had led me down different paths. Well, I, I don't have an answer, a good answer for that, really, to be honest. Uh, and I, I'm just, I just don't have that technical uh, capacity for that. I, I'll say that when we were making some of those maps and we uh, we wanted to have three of those map art pieces, and they're beautiful. They're they're large pieces. They're uh, you know forty by thirty six. They're watercolors, acrylics. They're oils on canvas. They're they're beautiful. Uh, we made we made prints uh, and and posters out of three of them, and one was for the Zuni village. One was for a larger regional area, um, and the other was for I think waterways, but um, uh, so it was sort of a, a initiative within the larger initiative because we we brought together Zuni language experts, and for example, we were putting place names onto the on the onto the maps as, as to be posters, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's all, it was interesting and, and uh, comical in, in some ways, too, because some people would say the name of one place and then another part of the team, other members of the team would say, that's not how we say it on the south side. And Zuni's not even that big. You know, it's like the, the middle village versus the south side versus uh, another family and how they say something. But regardless, it was like, and then try to figure out the spelling using the international phonetic alphabet. That was another challenge, uh, but we finally did it. And we had all these place names on these posters. So the three maps were made in the posters. And then uh, we were to give them free to every Zuni household, three uh, three sets. And and when they would come into the, the museum, uh, the, 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 the first committee that I mentioned, we talked to about the, the whole effort in the first place, said that we should probably just keep these for Zunis. Uh, because they said if they got out, uh, somebody might name a restaurant in Santa Fe after after this sacred spring, or uh, somebody's going to come up with a I don't know uh, a bike club in in Moab uh, based, yeah. on, based on this 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 sacred place, and so they said oh, we'll we'll just we'll keep it for just for Zunis. So Zuni household members would come in and sign something. We gave them three three free posters. Uh, that keeping it to ourselves didn't last very long. And, and I figured that would be the case. Uh, it wasn't too long. It was like a few months later, um, a non-Native person came in and said, you know where I can get some more of those posters? Uh, this is a non-Native white guy. <laughs> 
you know where I can get some more of these posters? Uh, one of my friends here from Zuni gave me a couple, and I just wanted to know where I can get a couple more. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, you can't control that kind of a thing. Uh, <laughs> and I think even less. I mean, even less so if you if you digitize anything. Similarly, like my experience in museums, uh, if you digitize objects or things in a collection and they become part of a collections database that is open to the public, anybody can see it. The, the problem with that is the, the description of the objects better darn be correct because of, of an, an expression an ex uh, experience I had in Cambridge, England. We took Zuni's experts there. We looked at objects, and this is related to the maps, believe it or not, but we we looked at objects in the collections and we looked at one by one and we said, no, that's not what it is. Yes, that's true. That's what it is. Nope, that's not what it is. On and on. And we got to, and by the way, we didn't look at the catalog description because we didn't want that to bias us. We just mm. looked at the, the objects and then looked at the catalog description. But there was one set of things that we, we looked at, we studied it, and this is with some uh, Zuni elders, experts. And I said, okay, what does it say? The catalog says sacred musical instruments. And we said, no, that's not what these are. And the staff at the Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology said, uh, are you sure? And we said, hell yeah, we're sure. We we make these and we still use these kinds of things. Uh, we are people of the source of these. We know. And and uh, the, the staff said, well, oh my goodness, a, a person just finished her dissertation based on these items in the class. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I, I had to ask, like, how many degrees do you think you've bestowed uh, on students at this uh Long, long place, uh, Cambridge University in, in Cambridge, England. And he said, probably quite a few. Wow. And, and so the, the, the lesson learned there is like, better set the record straight before you put anything online that's like this. And that can be with maps too. So if you, if you have a map that's that um, for a tribe, for example, that says our the extent of our lands is to here and here that could come back to haunt you later when you have land claims that you want to put forward in 50 years later in the future you better be better have the spelling right you better have locations right you better have all this information and context right before you put it online but once you put anything even a little bit there's there's no such thing as well we'll share just a little because mm -hmm. in truth a little bit goes a long way. It's going to spread. It's it's going to get out. So I think it's it's up to experts, people with a lot more technological ability than me, to to figure out how to do these things. I know there's passwords. I know you can create boxes or files and, and that are accessible only to certain people. But there's also people who are experts that know how to get into those sorts of things. So, uh, that, so this is a this is a a puzzle for. The, the next generations of, of students in this area as we start talking about the ethos of truth and and information. And I think this be, should be a very important topic for them. So Jim, I think your your stories about Cambridge and so on really relate very directly to the another question in the chat from Paul Biaghi, if I'm saying his name correctly, Paul. Um, who is actually asking a question relative to your work. Uh, what is the relationship between understanding and experience? Can we experience without understanding? And it's a very compelling question. And I think it goes to the heart of a lot of what we're talking about. Um, you know, the idea of a map not being equivalent to its place. So Richard was making that, I'm paraphrasing what Richard was talking about. Uh, but this came up last night when we were introducing the uh, science fiction collection at the Telluride Institute of some 15,000 volumes. And the originator of the collection, John Clute, is very strongly of the belief that one needs to have the physical experience of the book, the smell of the book, the tactility of the book, a real appreciation of that embodied interaction, that intimate experience of the book. At the same time, it's very useful for 
interoperability and other kinds of ways of connecting that data to other data sets and seeing this bigger picture of going through a digitizing process. But in that uh, attempt to understand this set of objects, are we bypassing the experience of that object in some uh, fundamental way? And I would say that some of the stories you were telling me last night, you know, where people, folks are not really engaging the objects uh, tactily and in meaningful ways directly, but they are being reduced. It's a very reductive process of coming up with a schema that can define an object in a digitized context. They're both useful, but we do miss something. So I think Paul Biaghi's question is very pertinent. Yeah, I I I think so. You know, that's um, when when some people come to, well, even if I was to go to another culture and if I had the if I had the privilege to observe some a ceremony or a ritual, and actually I have now that I think of it, I think at one time I was in Burkina Faso and uh, was was watching something happening at a uh, riverside at a river. By a, by a river and uh, there were chickens being offered put into the water and I, I wasn't prepared but a giant al albino catfish lunged out of the wa water and grabbed it <laughs> and and there were there were shouts and chants and I experienced it but I did not understand it uh, <laughs> Uh, but what I came away with is that uh, there's there's certainly some power happening there. <laughs> there's power, and there was people that had strong beliefs, and uh, I, I came away again with with, uh, with respect, and again knowing that the world is a very diverse and disparate place. Uh, I think when we talk about understanding and experience, it, it reminds me of. Well, you're Telluride, maybe the Telluride Institute, and if we're talking about sustainability and goodwill and uh, uh, inclusivity and all the rest, we, for us again, it, it, and, and sharing this information within that ethos of truth is we do that in a way that we we either. I would say we we want to not want wanting to be like speak about it, but we should speak from it. Yeah. Well, that so we on the outside and talk about it, but if we speak from it, that means we are participating in it. We buy into it. We have knowledge of it. We've experienced it, and we can speak from it. Yeah, that's beautiful, and and that I think that answers Jim's or Paul's question for sure. I mean, when as as an educator, part of the goal of our watershed curriculum and water quality studies is to get students to really engage in the physical world, in the in the environment, in it, having an embodied experience of place, to feel the temperature, to feel to stand in the water, to to gather the macro invertebrates. I mean, in the case of this particular curriculum, you know, there's really a an understanding of the the full sensory spectrum uh, of engagement. And again, it's not reductive, and it's not uh, reduced to okay, some kind of book understanding. But it's it's a and when it, when those students go out for the first time, they're not necessarily understanding at all, but they're enchanted, they're engaged. They're experiencing fully, and that only the significance of that only comes to bear much, much later. Oftentimes, um, wonderful to talk to you, Jim. <laughs> we could go well, on, I, but uh, we have a. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a scholar. Uh, well, you know, I, I I read sometimes, but um, <laughs> I I. I, I get so much of what I know really comes from my farming. It's just, uh, you know, farmers are very uh, pragmatic and they need to be uh, 
they need to be persuaded. Jim, let me let me ask you, uh, we only have a little bit of time and I want to, uh, before we end this session, talk about the upcoming programs a little bit. But I, I've had a, a love since I've known about it of the uh, GIS maps being produced by the Colorado Plateau Foundation. You have a remarkable map creator. Uh, really, she's an artist. Uh, and and many different, you know, the energy uh, processing systems in the Colorado Plateau, the uh, the very various uh, uh, geo feature. I mean, the, but those are GIS maps. Those are computer generated maps, but they're quite artful and they're also very informatively uh, considered. Um, you want to talk for a moment about just the Colorado Plateau and its mapping efforts? Uh, uh, so, so I, I, I lead a, a a philanthropy called the Colorado Plateau Foundation, and so we we do more than get grants out the door. The grant making is very important, as is grantee support, but we also do uh, public education, and through through our, our communications program, so that's very important. Is public education? We want to create a more informed citizenry about the plateau about that well it, it, that that it's not all doom and gloom that it, that there's actually very positive things happening there's a lot of innovation going on and ideas so that includes uh, some uh, new mapping we're starting to take on it's just, as as part of always trying to find a way to innovate I'm sorry to communicate innovatively so we can communicate like this we we can communicate with uh social media, through radio, through podcasts, with blogs, and other things, but we want to open it up and just expand how we communicate. So some of those now we're going to try start doing some mapping that are uh, different ways of communicating place to people. Yeah, they're really beautiful uh, efforts. Uh, oh, we're just, we're just, just getting a start on that. Just getting started. That's yeah. great. So I want to Thank uh, Dan and and Jim. Uh, we're not uh, le we're not going off yet, but I want to just give the, our viewers and listeners uh, a sense of what's coming up uh, along uh, this e ecological whole systems dynamic approach to what is information and how should we think about understand and apply uh, understandings. Uh, to that environment, which we are greatly manipulating without much understanding of. So um, shortly, uh, in less than a half hour, um, we have a session uh, starting at uh, 310, uh, which is a two-part program, a, a brief conversation with two brothers, uh, one of whom I met in person last spring in New York City. He's a physicist working in nanophotonics. Uh, working with light rather than working with photons rather than electrons. And that portends, to my mind, uh, a whole new way of thinking uh, that moves beyond digital. You know, we've unfortunately, I think, imposed digital on, off, either, or, good, bad, me, you kind of logic on our society, not just on our tools. And uh, that's, that's been deeply concerning. And I think photonics, an understanding of light, uh, you know, and, and, and the cracks where the light comes in uh, is, uh, is really uh, going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, two brothers, Visak Menon and Vinod Menon. Vinod is a physicist. His brother, Visak, is an artist, a graphic artist, designer, who in fact designed the graphic poster for this conference, for this art and science program. And mm -hmm. they're going to be joined by uh, August Muth, a holographer, uh, one of the most interesting and uh, unique holographers in that he's not taking uh, making holograms of images. He's not just creating 3D images. He's actually creating holograms that are just windows into a world of light, just the essence of that medium. And it's just... Uh, gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's not about meaning. It's actually about an experiential, an experiential uh, 
an intimate experiential uh, learning opportunity, a, a new opening of a new window in a way. Uh, so I think that's going to be a fascinating talk in a little while. Uh, tomorrow, Monday, uh, we have a conversation and presentations by three physicists. Uh, Eric Smith will be joining us from Tokyo. Uh, and uh, uh, Edwin Valentin from Grun Gruningen in Netherlands, where he is an astrophysicist. Uh, and I think he may have been joining us today and watching this program. And uh, Mark Nayrink who's uh, sitting downstairs here at the Wilkinson Library watching this presentation on the big screen. Uh, so we're gonna have physicists, astrophysicists, cosmologists, and a biophysicist talking about what is information. Uh, as physicists say, it's fundamental to the universe, energy and information, matter comes later. Uh, and uh, it's also fundamental to the origin of life. Uh, there is anything that's alive senses and communicates and responds to its environment and even shares information as it reproduces. And uh, so information is not just human, it is, or animal, it exists at the micro and macro scale of reality. And that, so that's coming up tomorrow, uh, a talk with uh, Joshua Garland uh, tomorrow about issues of actually the political and even uh, military and other uh, issues around information of misinformation and disinformation uh, and, uh, and information warfare, in fact, which is uh, pervasive these days, whether we know it or not. Um, on Tuesday, we have a beautiful session that uh, Jim may be really interested in, and that's communication of plants and animals uh, that are being explored by some uh, wonderfully creative people that are going to be participating on Tuesday. Uh, on Wednesday, a session on ecological information economics. Uh, really, how do you understand value? How do you exchange things that our current system in this country calls intangibles and externalities. That includes information, that includes learning, that includes health, all the intangibles that we don't know how to value as a country. Uh, and instead, given our political economic system, we subsidize those things. There, we don't really understand how to value healthcare uh, or learning or raising families. Uh, and so on. And yet those are the determinants of quality of life. Uh, material goods and exchange is not the quality of life uh, in the way most of us might understand it. So I think that's going to be a fascinating area, just talking about the economy of information. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, we're also doing a special connection with the SIGGRAPH conference in Denver, which is happening concurrently. That's the big computer graphics international conference that happens every year. And we have a couple of, uh, a few remarkable uh, creative people joining us from there, including Tamiko Thiel, who's getting the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, in computer graphics and AR and VR and XR. And she's based uh, primarily in Munich, Germany, born in the in Oakland, California, and of mixed heritage. Uh, Tamiko is going to be a, a really special guest, along with Helen Nicole Costas, who is uh, in charge, is running the uh, NASA Earth Imaging Lab. And they're providing and gathering data as well as imagery that they're looking to share greatly with other entities for climate change, for water, for health, for all sorts of applications. And I would think Colorado Plateau Foundation and others might have a, a growing relationship with the Earth Imaging Lab, uh, and so may many of us. Uh, on Thursday uh, of this coming week, we have uh, a group that I've encountered earlier in the year called Artists with Evidence. And they include uh, Ali Akbar Mehta, and Ines Montalbao, uh, uh, who are based in Helsinki, Finland, at the Alvar Aalto in, uh, University. And they're joined by one of their associates, a man named Colin Greer, uh, 
uh, who is the president of the New World Foundation and also very involved in human rights issues for a long, long time. And he's a professor uh, and a poet and a theater maker. Uh, and they're going to be talking with my friend Issa Niafaga from Cameroon, uh, who's in the States right now. Uh, and Issa comes from an, a remarkable background uh, as a young political cartoonist. He was imprisoned, tortured, uh, gotten out by French human rights groups to Paris, where he was part of Charlie Hebdo just at the time of their terrorist assassinations. Uh, in, Af in Cameroon, he's established the first rural public uh, community radio station to provide education and healthcare information to tribal communities uh, in Africa, as well as he's working on women's reproductive rights issues and raising money for those kinds of things. So a wonderful conversation with Issa uh, coming up on Thursday. And on Friday, the last day of this program, uh, an open conversation, the community commons, uh, the information commons, to talk about anything some of the participants want to talk about, as well as let's talk about what next. Let's not just say congratulations, that was great, but might we uh, talk about some next steps? And that's on uh, Friday at the end of this week. So uh, we're gonna log off for uh, 15 minutes and log back on at 10 minutes after three with uh, the Menon brothers and others talking about photonics. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jim. You bet. Pleasure.